HBC Digest Radio, welcome back. I'm your host, Jared Carter, continuing our coronavirus and COVID-19 pandemic response uh, with the best and brightest from the historically black college and university community. Today is a friend of the show and a distinguished guest, the chancellor of North Carolina A&T State University, Dr. Harold Martin, uh, who today announced a uh, preliminary uh, framework for the reopening of A&T this fall. First, Dr. Martin, uh, as usual, it's an honor to have you on. Um, you're among the first HBCU presidents or chancellors uh, to to start to address a framework for how opening and operating will look in the fall. Can you talk about some of the, 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 the information that you've received and uh, some of the ways in which you've worked with the state and the UNC system uh, to arrive at a place where you're you're today making that announcement? Uh, first, let me thank you for all you do on behalf of our universities, Jared, uh, and uh, capturing, doing the fact-finding, and sharing accurate information with all of our constituents. So, really, thank you on behalf of all historical black colleges and universities, and I'm delighted to be with you this evening and share perspectives about our university and how we see ourselves moving forward uh, and planning for the future, quite frankly, especially fall 2020. All of the universities in the UNC system um, are working very closely through their chancellors with the president of the university system and the board of governors and through a framework uh, under the umbrella of the governor setting um, how the state will function as he's currently doing. And everything we in the university system of North Carolina and each of our respective campuses are operating within that framework. Um, what we have resolved uh, very recently as chancellors with the president of the university system and the board of governors is that we have to begin to share with our constituents a very candid discussion about uh, the future of the university system of North Carolina and each of our respective campuses about the business of our universities come fall 2020 so that our families and their sons and daughters uh, can begin to make um, um, frank decisions and and challenging decisions about what they're going to do in the fall based on our guidance. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have an exceptional group of new freshmen slated to come to our university this fall. We have a record number of students on our campus this year who are wanting to know how they will engage with our university next fall. Uh, quite honestly, we have a record number of graduates who are leaving our university this year as graduates, and we want to send off in a, a, a exceptional celebratory way. And as you know, HBCUs, graduation is a big deal. Yes, sir. And so we're trying to frame how we are going to celebrate through a face-to-face -face commencement and an appropriate time in the future, mm -hmm. uh, commencement for our graduates. But in the meantime, a virtual celebratory activity, which we will announce to our uh, graduates uh, very shortly as we celebrate them and all their hard work, quite honestly. And so we are uh, uh, working very closely with our president, as I indicated earlier, to frame a very well-defined plan discussion uh, with contingencies built in as to how we will see ourselves operating in fall 2020. And my announcement today essentially has said that to our campus community, our constituents, our students, and their families. You serve as one of three uh, executives within the system that is advising um, the USC system president on, you know, the data um, and some of the kind of peripheral considerations that it would take for all 17 of the Carolina public campuses to, to reopen and to do so safe is safely. And in your letter today, you talked about that th the virus may still be here without a vaccine when it's time to do this, but also the creativity and innovation that A&T will lead to try to do so and protect its faculty, students and and visitors and guests. So What's the process like in working on campus to figure out logistically, culturally, how do you glean information and then craft a set of recommendations to say, if we're going to do it, this is how you should do it, because this is what A&T is seeing. Excellent question. We have 
created a planning committee of uh, key administrators who oversee functions of our university that are most significant to opening and operating our university in an appropriate fashion come this fall. Mm -hmm. And within that planning committee, which includes um, key administrators such as my provost, my vice chancellor of research, uh, senior uh, student affairs administrator, senior research administrator, general counsel, uh, I'll give you some example of some of the key people on that committee. They oversee working groups. Um, for example, a working group on academic affairs is working very closely with the provost and uh, vice chancellor for research to evaluate the most effective way for delivering academic degree programs and engaging um, opportunities for our faculty to continue their research uh, in their research facilities on our campus uh, and the technology that's going to be required uh, for them to be able to do that. There's a committee looking at um, students and student enrollment and housing and dining, uh, for example, to evaluate how we will accommodate students in our residence halls and allow them to have access to dining facilities, uh, for example, um, and providing for uh, support services to provide tutorial assistance, counseling services, uh, health center access, and things like that. Also looking at um, athletics and how, uh, under the oversight of the NCAA, our um, conference um, board and athletics directors, uh, how we may potentially um, engage in sporting events, such as football. Mm -hmm. um, and if um, the circumstances are appropriate for doing so, uh, for example. And there's also a budgetary committee looking at the resources we're going to need to fund whatever the contingency plans are that we ultimately settle in for operating our universe in fall 2020, the cost of doing that and the resources deployed to make sure that we're able to do that. The technology, additional personnel, staffing, uh, for example, and services. Um, those committees are shaped and are working now. They're beginning their work um, and they will funnel their strategic thinking up through the planning committee that reports to me. It's an excellent group of faculty, staff, students, um, and administrators on our campus who are helping us think this through. And these are very complex issues. So, for example, in a best case scenario, if the coronavirus is under control and there are vaccines in place and the, the tail end of this uh, virus is um, uh, trending to zero or to a controllable level, we may be able to have full open classrooms, students in our residence halls, access to our, our dining facilities, and engagement of meetings and social events on our campus mm -hmm. in a normal mode. It's highly unlikely that's going to be the case. It is likely that we will still have um, the requirements as mandated potentially, for example, by our governor, who says that we will be open for business, but we will still be required to operate under the conditions of social distancing mm -hmm. uh, and may not be able to engage in an environment where there are more than 50 people in an environment uh, where people are meeting, as an example. If that's the case, we may have to uh, house students in our residence halls in a very different way. Right. Fewer students in the residence halls, fewer students in the room, um, and fewer students gathering in meetings or functions. How students gather in our classrooms, uh, for example, or in our dining spaces. How faculty um, arrive on the campus, for example. And so if we are required to engage in some level of social distancing, that also means that we will have to have in place high levels of testing of everyone yeah. who returns back to our campus. Um, 
uh, so that we can assess who can and cannot come back to the campus. And there will have to be ongoing testing. So we'll have to make sure that the state is making provisions for easy access to tests so that our, all of our students and our faculty and staff are tested before they step foot back on the campus, but they are routinely tested in the same way that every university in the system will have to have access to the same level of testing. And in the event uh, that we are social distancing, we want to have to have a hybrid delivery of instruction. Um, for example, we may make provisions for new freshmen to have a higher level of face-to-face -face instruction on campus because many of these students will be coming out of high schools where they are not as accustomed to um, online instruction. Right. Uh, and they may need a higher level of interactions, engagement face-to-face. -face. So we'll have to make provisions for that and provide a high level of uh, online instruction complementing face-to-face instruction as well so that we give our students uh, options. Those who want to come back to the campus can do so. Those who want to remain at home would be able to do that uh, and still gain access to a high-quality instructional mode online, for example. So we are, we'll be exploring, based on the circumstances we may engage in, um, come fall 2020, um, with plans in place that will allow us uh, based on our uh, contingency planning, to call into the plans, the aspects of the plan that allows us to accommodate in the most efficient way the engagement of our students uh, through instruction and support, as well as the opportunities for our faculty who have significant levels of research. And we're third in the university system in research. So we've got to get this work done as well. And our faculty want to continue that research that involves a high volume of our graduate students, for example. And so our planning processes are put into place. They're beginning their work. They will explore all aspects of possibility. One aspect may be to shift our, the start of our school year to a month later as a possibility, for example, and end it later in December, maybe early in the new uh, calendar year. So those are the innovative, creative things we're looking at. And these committees are charged to take a look at, quite honestly, as we shape plans for the future. You mentioned in your letter that a, a college campus or a university campus is designed for human interaction and engagement. Um, right. It's, right. it's designed to have a bunch of people <laughs> in one space at one time for any given activity. Um, and right. even though you guys and so many other schools were able to creatively stand up online learning very quickly, and I think history will be very kind for the way y'all did that, but the return of that, the spirit of that, the culture of that being different is something that will seem to me clash with the logistical challenges of this. Do you look at what a ts culture and what the logistics of reopening and is there one from each pile that worries you the most culturally and logistically like, man, if, if I'm going to stay awake at night thinking about how we're going to do this and move forward, these two things are the kind of uh, they, they worry me the most. Absolutely. Well, at the, at the core of what keeps me up and what will be at the forefront of our thinking as we move into the new year, uh, that's, that's everything. First, the health and safety of our students and our faculty and our staff. That, that is paramount. And so we clearly have to keep that in, in our minds as we think through our plans for the future. But also, our students love being on our campus. They love engaging with their peers, their friends, the engagement and connections with our faculty and our staff, the, the support services provided for them, uh, for example. That's, that those are attributes of historical black colleges and universities in general, and it's particularly acute on our campus. Right. As we as I uh, uh, share with our board and our uh, senior staff, engaging our students uh, and helping to provide development opportunities for enhancing their skill sets and the, 
and realizing their high aspirations for their futures is a big deal for a university. And so uh, that's troublesome to me that we would not be able to provide for our students potentially this fall uh, that high level of engagement and interaction and rich culture of uh, support for our students that we're accustomed to providing for them. That's troublesome to me, and as well as our board uh, and our administrative team and our faculty and our fellows, and I met with the executive committee of our faculty senate last week, for example, and we'll continue to meet with them in this fashion even throughout um, uh, the semester and this summer, and our staff senate executive committee because they, as part of our core values, have fully in, immersed themselves in supporting our students as well. And it's troublesome to them as well. And so we'll have to figure this out. Uh, Jared, we really will. And that's why we're starting the planning early. And that's why we're saying in a very candid way, we want to return to a, a an operational mode that provides the very best environment under the circumstances for engaging our students. And then the final question, and again, we're, we're so appreciative of your time. Um, recently, a letter went out from the Council of 1890 Presidents, um, you know, a formal request to uh, congressional committees on, on education and labor to make a, a sizable investment in HBCUs and the land grant black colleges uh, to the tune of almost one point five billion dollars uh, in the in the support of technological upgrades and new programs and. Uh, new health health care and health sciences professional development. A and T obviously is our biggest four year institution, um, one of our largest and most expansive in, in you know in, in teaching and, and training in those areas. What did you think about that that letter? And if if even one of those requests was to come to pass, what kind of benefit would it yield in one helping to get the campus back up to as close to normal as could be, and two even propelling it to something greater as we move ahead? Well, I, w I would say to you that um, uh, first, it, it would be appropriate for me on behalf of all of our historically black college universities to thank uh, Alma Adams for all of the incredible work she has been doing in working with uh, Mark Walker uh, and others, quite honestly, as part of the uh, HBCU Bipartisan Committee mm -hmm. in creating just incredible visibility by HBCUs, uh, and thank you and what you have done with HBCU Digest and continue to keep before the public the incredible role that historical black colleges and universities play. And out of the work of the bipartisan uh, HBCU committee has come legislation that has provided continuing funding support uh, for our historical black colleges and universities, we have seen uh, the conversation uh, during the Democratic primaries, uh, the focus of every candidate um, on the important role of historical black colleges and universities. Never before have we seen that high level of importance of historical black colleges and universities to the landscape and future of our nation as a whole. Right. And it's also created a platform then for um, requests, legitimate requests mm -hmm. for funding support um, to Congress uh, for uh, additional focus on historical black colleges and universities through the CARES Act. And uh, quite honestly, the letter you made reference to uh, from the chair of our 1890. Um, Council of Land Grant Institutions, um, uh, Abdullah, President Abdullah at Virginia State, mm -hmm. making a request of a little over a billion dollars on behalf of the 19, uh, 1890 land grant institutions. An appropriate request. These dollars not only would provide for the continuing work that the 1890 land grant institutions have done historically, but expand what we've done in the that we were expected to do in the future in supporting our students, uh, enabling our universities to 
continue to engage through agricultural extension and engagement through all of our aspects of our university in supporting our communities, our regions, and our states as a whole, and enabling HBCUs to have direct and substantial impact and growth in the impact that we have in our, in our nation as a whole, and certainly in our states and our regions, our economic impact. Uh, most of our universities are located in rural communities, in the minority communities of our cities and our states, where we play a very vital role in addition to graduating high numbers of African-American students in critical degree areas of importance to our nation as a whole as well. And so legitimate requests on behalf of our institutions, both to the CARES Act, as well as the special requests on behalf of the 19 language institutions, quite honestly, a big deal for us. Uh, and because of the work of the bipartisan committee uh, and Alma Adams, quite uncomfortable, comes from Alma Adams. She's just done some remarkable work on our behalf, mm -hmm. uh, quite honestly. And so that's creating uh, tremendous support for our institutions. And, you know, quite honestly, the investments, uh, individuals are re beginning to realize, Jared, that there is great return that's right. from those investments that have been made in our institutions, quite honestly. And so, so I'm very pleased about it. Um, unabashedly supportive of these requests because there is great return from our institutions um, for every dollar invested in our institutions. So 